Today, we're going to talk technique. Something I get a lot of questions about. I do have some technique videos out there, but they're like five, ten years old. So I thought it was time to make something current. And I call this mechanics of motion. So join me here on It's Cup of Time. All right, mechanics of motion. We're first going to talk about the mechanics in drumming because I want to really explain how that's very different than what we do playing the gongs, bowls, bells, and other instruments that we tend to play. So in drumming, it's horizontal. Sticks are pretty much parallel to the ground when we play. And in that capacity, we are working against gravity. Because if I just sort of open my hand, the stick is it's going to drop. Because gravity is pulling it down. And also, there's weight on the end here. I mean, if I move further back, where there's more weight on the back end, the stick will go the other way. But in drumming, it's all about the horizontal. Now, part of this is with a drum, or in this case, the practice pad, we're getting a rebound. And we can use that to help throw the stick back up. And in playing a drum, you use the rebound for that. But if we just think about the mechanics of this, we're horizontal. And every time we go down, we have to pull the stick back up. Again, against gravity, because the tug of gravity wants to bring it down. So if I open my hand, the stick is going to go down. Now the same thing, if we're a mallet player, and we're playing vibes, marimba, any of those instruments, it's the same sort of thing. We're working against gravity. And in this case, with a mallet, there's even more weight on the end to just want to pull that head down. And you can feel a big difference between a drumstick. You can get that fairly well balanced and moving up and down. You don't feel much. You don't feel that tug, especially because you're playing more at what we would call the balance point here. And it's pretty even. Now, if you're playing a mallet, you tend to be playing more towards the end. And again, this wound head is heavy, so it's going to really want to pull it down. So if I do this sort of motion with a mallet, I can really feel it. I can really feel this tug and I can feel like, oh, I have to pull this up every time. There's a lot of effort involved. For example, let's say you're playing vibes or marimba and you've got two mallets in a hand. That's even more weight to have to pull up to try to balance. Now in the case of stick length too, here's a different type of marimba mallet that has a longer handle for a longer reach. And often you'll be holding it at the very end here. And there's a lot of weight. That's a big head. There's a lot of weight there. So in playing traditional drums or mallet instruments, we're really working against gravity. And that's how the mechanics work. 
pulling this heavy weight up every time you want to play and make a new stroke. That you're pulling this weight up. Now again with the drumstick we can sort of find the balance point where it sits and it's not so bad and we have the advantage of the rebound from the drum head or the pad which helps throw the stick back up. Now even with this if I I get a little bit of bounce on a pad, but if you hit a piece of wood or a piece of metal, as in a marimba or a vibraphone, you those are very solid <laughs> materials. You're not getting all that rebound that you would play in a drum. I can play a drum with these or the pad and I, I'm still getting some rebound. So that's the main difference here is, again, drumming is horizontal like this. Now, in playing gongs, take a little larger mallet here, in gongs it's more vertical, where we're holding the mallet up or possibly holding the mallet down if we have a gong below. Now you can hold it sideways too, but then with a gong mallet it's going to have an even bigger head, it's going to be even heavier, and that force of gravity is going to be even more, trying to pull that down. So we want to look at two main techniques for playing gongs. One is what I devised on my own based on my drumming background, and I've been using since I started playing all these instruments. And the other is a different method that I rarely use, but one that is probably the most popular out there. So I want to examine both and talk about, I guess, the pros and cons of each and what the differences are. So let's look at the mechanics of the gong stroke. Let's look at the first method. This has been taught and popularized by my good friend from Germany, Jens Zuga. And what this is, is probably what I would call a natural grip or a tool grip. Because if I was to take any sort of tool with a handle and give it to somebody, they would most likely grab it like this, wrap their hand around it, and you can see, and their thumb would come to the side. Now this is especially like if you're using a hammer or any sort of tool like that, this is how you would grip something. Now with Jens, it's, it's a loose grip so that, as you can see, the mallet is moving around within the hand. And he works with sort of letting the head bounce off of the gong. And it's a very loose grip, sometimes with a little finger here holding it tighter. And this works great for a lot of people. And I have nothing against the grip. Sometimes I do use it when I need a very soft note and a soft stroke because with this sort of motion here, it's not going to push into the gong as much as really come off. And I can get a very soft stroke out of a gong. And like I said, I, I see other people play in videos in that, and I think that's probably the most used sort of grip. The tool grip. The natural grip, whatever you want to call it. And that's great. But as we were talking earlier about drumming and playing drums, which I have played drums for over 50 years, so this whole idea is really integrated into my brain and my nervous system, my muscle memory and everything. And it, with that type of grip, the actual grip, 
Now with that type of grip, the actual grip is right here with the thumb and the forefinger somewhere in there and it forms a fulcrum and then these fingers are loosely around and that is the basic drumstick grip. So again, I came up playing gongs back in the 70s. I didn't know anybody else who was working extensively with gongs and there were really just very few people here in America and some people over in Europe doing it. So I had to come up with all my own techniques and ideas. So for me, it was natural to take the drumstick idea, transfer it over to the gong mallet, but slightly modify it. Because again, we don't play gongs like this. We play gongs mainly like this. So I modified what was natural to me, the drumstick grip. And instead of having the thumb back here and having a grip like this, I moved the thumb up a little. I had the grip here with all the fingers. And what I use this the thumb for is to push against that. And that gives me two important things. It gives me control against this coming back if I just have a loose grip. And it also gives me a sense of motion and of pressure. I can use my thumb as a pressure gauge. How much pressure am I applying on the gong, on my stroke? So this is my basic stroke and grip is more open the hand like this. So it's all fingers, mainly. Some wrist, it's, for me, it's never this. It's never arms. And I see a lot of people doing this arm thing. And if I'm doing arms, it's mainly because I'm reaching to play a different gong or something. So I'm using my arm for the reach. But I like to be close into my gongs. I'll play right on top of them as opposed to standing back here and try to play the gongs. So, again, going back to drumming, as an example, if you were to give a beginner a drumstick, they're going to play the drums like this. They're going to start like this, all arms, because that's a natural sort of motion. Again, this tool motion, this hammering motion. As they develop more skill, more muscle coordination, we lose this big arm sort of thing and we get more into the wrist. Less motion, more efficiency. Then, as we move further, we get more into the fingers and the hand itself. Again, less motion, more efficiency. So taking that from drumming, I'm going to switch to a, a smaller mallet here. It'll be easier to demonstrate. It's the same thing. I see people playing gongs like this. There's no need to do that. And I challenge any of you to take a large gong mallet and just stand there and swing it like this for, let's say, 20 seconds. Your arm is going to be really tired because that's a lot of weight to swing around in a big motion through the air. A complete waste of energy and efficiency. So again, we're talking about the mechanics of motion. We don't want big motions. I mean, unless you're trying to hit the gong as hard as you can to get a really big, big crash. Yeah, then you do that, but there's no need to do that. There really isn't. I never do that. Okay, so sort of the beginner stroke is a lot of arm. As you get more facility, more control over the muscles, more wrist. And then further control and facility, more fingers. But this takes time and it takes practice. 
And I'm always emphasizing the gong is a musical instrument. It's not any different than playing piano, violin, saxophone, guitar, any of those. And you need to practice. You can't just expect to show up on Saturday for your gong session and you're going to have all your technique down. It doesn't work that way. You need to practice. So let's look at the two ways I mainly play. I will use the wrist, but then I will use the fingers because that gives me a lot of control. There's a lot of tactile information here in my hand, in my fingers. Okay, so like I said, the tool grip is a loose grip like this where you're sort of bouncing off the gong. And I'll use that for soft strokes. In my grip, the thumbs grip, I like to be able to use the fingers and the thumb and get some leverage right in here. Let's look at this. Right in here. It's a fulcrum in here. And I can let, part of it is I can let the motion pull the mallet back and also bouncing it off the gong. I do get some rebound. So when I hit the gong, this can bounce back and throw it back here. But I have the thumb here to control that. Otherwise for me, it's like, it's just, it's wobbling. That's the one thing I don't like about this sort of thing. I feel it's, it's more of a wobbly grip. And I know it works for a lot of people and that's really great because we're all different and we need to find what works for us. But what I wanna talk about here is an alternative grip to the tool grip here. And that's the thumb grip. So mainly I'm using my fingers here and my thumb here, and I can control how things are moving in there. Okay, like this. And with the thumb here, I can stop it if I need to. If it's coming back, I can stop it by pushing it forward. I can also apply pressure as I'm hitting the gong striking it. I can pl apply pressure to it. And again, this is sort of a pressure gauge and I can use it to determine how hard I'm hitting by how much pressure I'm either putting on the mallet or is coming back into my thumb from the mallet. So let's take a look at a few strokes here. I've got the mallet and it's in an upright position. My arm is not moving. My hand is not, or my wrist is not really moving. It's, it's more hand. It's none of this, none of this big motion. There's even none of this big jerky wrist motion. It's more in the hand and the fingers. And again, because I have the thumb here giving me some leverage, if I need to be louder, I don't necessarily have to come back here to get a big loud stroke. I can apply leverage with my thumb as I'm going towards the gong to give more force to the stroke. So I can play very lightly. Or, and if I do need more force, then I can start to use a little bit of wrist, maybe just a little bit of elbow, not a big stroke like this, but I can... You know, a little more motion there. Now the other part of this, 
if we go back again to the drumstick, horizontal, and you're always lifting, playing mallet instruments, vibes, marimba, you're always lifting, you're fighting gravity. The idea here is to keep your mallet vertical so that you don't fight gravity, what I call the defying gravity stroke here. And I can, I can move this all day as a pendulum. And I can play like this, even with a large mallet like this. This is a Vic Firth GB1. It's very heavy. I can play this all day. And not be tired because I'm not lifting anything. I'm just swinging it back and forth. Gravity is pulling down this way. So I'm just holding it up and I'm using that pendulum motion. But also, I'm not getting a, you know, a wide swing like this, where if I let it come back real far, gravity's gonna take over and pull it. But if I keep it pretty much in the vertical here, for example, using a roller here, I can do this for an hour easily with one or two mallets, you know, one in each hand. Look how far I'm moving off the gong. Barely. I'm not coming back like this. And also, to be able to make a quick stroke, you can't come way back here because you have all this distance to travel. So I keep it fairly close. See, this doesn't deviate from the vertical very much. Not coming back here, gravity takes over. Not going too far forward. If I'm far away, gravity's taking over, so. And I can control this. I'm playing softly right now. I have full control. I'm barely moving my hand barely moving the mallet. And I can keep this where I want. If I want to bring it up, a little more pressure, slightly bigger stroke. So you can see, I did that crescendo, but I didn't crescendo by playing here and then coming way out and doing this. It was all here from the muscles in my hand and from my thumb, able to apply a little more pressure going forward. Another thing I will do, and people have mentioned in watching me, is I move up and down the mallet all the time. I'll be doing this depending on how much force and pressure I want. Again, people ask me, what mallet can I use to play really quiet with? I had somebody email me that, and I said in reply, whatever mallets you have. There is no such thing as a soft, quiet mallet. There's no quiet mallet. There's no loud mallet. It's just a mallet. It's all about technique. So if I want to play very, very softly. What I do is I choke up on this here. And you can see I'm right under the head. So that way I can't do a big swing. I can only get small motions. And it's very controlled here. Now if I want to be able to play a little louder, I'll back off on the mallet so I get a little more motion available above the fulcrum here. Notice how that changed as I moved down the mallet handle.
This is all physics. So it's working with the mechanics of nature. So what's happening here is there's very little weight being thrown when I'm choking up on the head of the mallet. I'm not throwing much weight here. As I move back, I don't have to increase my swing much because there's more weight being thrown. I can increase the arc a little bit because the handle's longer, but what that allows me is to have more weight being thrown. So do this as a good example, is take any of your large mallets, whatever one you have, you take any of them, hold it right under the head and just do this. Now move down inch or two. Notice the difference, both in the movement, but also in you can start to feel the head more. Up here, I'm not really feeling the head. I'm not feeling the weight of the head at all. The handle sort of counterbalances all that head weight. So up here, I'm not really he feeling it. If I move down, now I'm starting to feel some weight here because the swing, let's get over here, the arc of the swing is a little bigger here. You know, it's pretty small. That's what gets, can get a little bigger. I can start to feel this weight being thrown. Move back, I can feel more. Even if I keep, keep it fairly close and keep it, you know, very small motion. Now I get down here to the bottom of the handle and yeah, I can really feel that weight. You know, do this now. It's like, yeah, you can really feel that weight. Do this, <laughs> sort of a big motion up here. You don't feel the weight. Down here, you feel the weight. So that's how it's working on the gong. Very little weight is being moved here. There's not a lot of force being thrown. Moving back, I get more force. Further back, You see, to open up the gong, I didn't have to start doing this to get a big motion and to get a lot of force in there. I'm just letting the natural force take over. And here I can get a little bigger swing, but there's more weight being thrown towards the gong. So I can get a bigger sound. And again, all these sort of ideas need to be practiced. And you could do this in the no thumbs grip too. The only problem is you don't have any sort of grip to move the mallet in one hand. I can't, I can't move this really. I would have to bring the thumb into play to push the mallet up or use my other hand to do that. Where here, I can climb up and down the mallet. I can let it slide down, I can climb back up, I can move it up and down. So people will see me playing Let's see, I don't have matched mallets here, but this is close enough. And I'll be playing. And I will be moving up and down the mallet to get a different weight, a different arc of swing, just to give me that, you know, more force. So again, I don't have to use arms to play loudly. I don't have to bash on the gong. I can use the mechanics of this pendulum motion and the weight of the head itself to give me a louder sound. So what are the cons of any of those methods? I guess for me, as I said, the only real con of the no thumbs method is you can't, you can't move it unless you just let it drop like this or if you turn your hand over to let it slide down, you know, like sliding. Open your hand and let it slide. You can't move. It's, it's kind of, I mean, you can let it go down a little bit like that by loosening your grip and then tightening it, but it's kind of hard to 
climb the mallet back up. Where here, I can move up and down the mallet handle. And again, this is a technique I devised all by myself because I had no one to use as an example. Back in the 1970s, who was playing gongs? Very few people. 1980s, very few people. So I had to take the techniques I already had from drumming and modify them slightly to work with playing the gongs. And for what was comfortable to me, because again, I've played drums a long time, so this is a very natural thing. To hold a drumstick in my hand is a very, very natural thing. I don't have to think twice about it. So, you know, using that sort of idea, expanding on it some. So let's talk about a couple other things here. Now, sometimes I do have to use my arm, but as I said, mainly it's to reach, to play, if I'm standing here, say I'm playing one gong here, yeah, I'll use my arm to reach. But then again, in the reach, it still comes down to the same sort of technique. I'm not reaching over and then taking a big arm swing or shoulder swing or something. Again, it's the wrist, it's the fingers, it's the hand. Same thing if I'm playing a gong below me, like this, I will just take, take my arm extended this way, I will just drop it down, keeping the same grip, the same everything, I will drop it down. Bring it up. Drop it down. So again, my arm is merely for extension, not for motion here. My arm is to take the motion here, the wrist, the hand, the fingers, and move it to somewhere else in order to continue that same idea. Now if I'm playing one directly below me, I might have to invert like this to play but I'm still using the same sort of motion, like this. Only now it's down below me. So again, it's just taking my arm to move my hand, which maintains the same grip everywhere. If I'm playing below me, I'm playing across from me, down across from me, in front of me. All I'm doing is using the arm to move the hand to different positions. If I had something above me, I could reach up, I would be doing the same thing. And that's what I like about this grip is because it's a secure grip, it's not wobbly, it's not slippery or anything like that. I can move all over. If I had a gong over here, I could be playing over here. Same grip, I'm not changing anything same mechanics. All right, so that's pretty much what I do with gongs, you know, no matter what type of mallet. Let's look at some other mallets here. We've got some base marimba mallets that I like to use. Very thin birch handles. I like mine with a rubber grip on the end, but it's the same motion. And I could move up on them, move back, are overly big, but it's all about using the thumb to help push the mallet into the gong and using the pendulum arc 
to allow the waiters ahead to go into the gong and give me either more sound or less sound. So I can take any mallet out there and I can play very quietly on the gong. Or given the size of the mallet, I can play loudly. Obviously with something like this, I'm not gonna get really loud because it won't activate the whole gong. I can have to really work at it, but you know, with any mallet, I can get whatever volume level I need that's appropriate to the mallet. And that's really important too. Picking the appropriate mallets for the sounds you want. Obviously, if I want a really big sound, I'm not gonna use a small marimba mallet like this. And it's a very small head. But you can see, I'm still able to bring up the volume with that, with a small one, with a large one. So it's all about mechanics of motion. So next, let's talk about, as long as we've got the gong here, let's talk about sweet spots, because a lot of people ask me that. There are three main spots in the gong. The very center, just off the edge, and then between the center and the edge. And you'll get very different tones there. In the center, you can hear that. It's a very full, there's a lot of bass, not a lot of overtones. It's a focused sound in the center. Now as I move out, I'm going to bring in more harmonics. So let's go halfway. Listen to that. More highs. Now towards the edge. Even a little more splashy there. So those are your three main sweet spots. One thing I have found is there is a difference between playing above the center and below the center. And that, I believe, comes from the gong being held by the cord. This top is a little more rigid than the bottom here. And oftentimes, depending on the gong, different sounds by playing above the center. And each gong is different. Each gong will have certain sweet spots. I've got some gongs where over here at what would be the 10 o'clock area, if you were thinking of an analog clock, I can get a certain sound. I don't get it directly across at two o'clock or down here at like five or seven. But over here, it's going to happen. Gongs are funny instruments and sometimes they have sweet spots in different areas. Or some of mine, I'll get a, a specific sound down here. Doesn't happen anywhere else in the gong. I gotta hit it exactly in the right spot to get the sound. And with a specific mallet. So, like I said, I do have some gongs right here, just above center. If I use the right mallet with the right weight to it, I can bring out amazing, gorgeous high harmonics. It's almost like if you're playing a, a stringed instrument and lightly touching the string, you can get the octaves above. It's almost that way. I get almost like the octave above. But that's again, practice. You have to find out where to activate each gong you have. And if you have as many gongs as I do, that's a lot of practice and a lot of work. Like I've got some new gongs and I've been practicing with them. 
so I know what mallet is best to get a certain sound. Where should I hit it to get a certain sound and all that. So a lot of time invested in learning new gongs as I get them. Another sort of sweet spot is taking like a marimba mallet or vibe mallet or something. It's activating the edge here. tends to bring up a real shimmering sort of sound as you could hear and again I'm not doing this it's just small motions I'm taking the same grip I'm just turning my hand over a bit or I could do it up here anywhere on the gong but I like to do that when I want that just sort of shimmering sound and sustaining that where there's not a lot of bottom it's a, more mids and highs and I have had people tell me well you shouldn't hit the edge of the gong you shouldn't play it there because you could damage the gong you could bend it or something only if you're like you know hammering the edge of the gong I've been doing this again since the 70s playing all my gongs I still have every gong I ever bought I still play them. And if I'm doing this, I could play this for five hours without stopping. I'm not going to hurt the gong. So the edge is a good spot when you have a regular Paiste gong, a Chinese Chow gong, any sort of rimmed gong. Playing the edge. Okay. So again, work with your gongs. Practice with them. Find out what mallet gets what sound on what spot. Then take another mallet. Play all through your gong find out what the spots are. If you have to, you know, make a chart, have a circle, name it, what gong it is, you know, and then write in where the sweet spots are and what mallet you use to get a certain sound. And then practice that a lot. Because when you're out there playing in front of people, when you're doing a gong session or a concert or whatever, you do not have time to stand there and go, oh, I want to make this sound. Oh, what mallet should I pick up? And then once you pick up a mallet, where should I strike the gong? <laughs> you don't have time to do that. So I have my mallet trays. I have one on each side. I have my mallets. And I'm playing, I just know I'm going to hit this gong over here. I want a certain sound. I'm going to pick up this mallet. And I will get the sound I want. But that comes from practice and understanding my instruments, understanding my mallets, and knowing beforehand what's going to happen. And that's just, you know, it, it's so important. Uh, I just cannot emphasize that enough. You need to practice with everything. Okay, enough on gongs for now. Let's talk about bowls and how I play singing bowls and rin bowls. In this part, we're going to look at playing bowls, both singing bowls and Japanese rin type bowls. Now, for me, it's rare that I'll you know, take a singing bowl and use a wand and go around the edge. I prefer to do that with a jobu bell. I think it's a, for my purposes, it works better. So with my bowls, 
I use them with a striking method. So here I have a few different bowls set up, similar to how I would array things on my performing setup. And if we look at the typical grip here again, like this, to play the bowls here, now I gotta like bend my arm in a very unnatural way. You know, get that elbow up. You know, look closer, you know, I gotta bend up like this. Get the elbow with the arm pointing down and then strike. And that really doesn't work for me. Now if I'm holding something in my hand and I'm going to strike it, then my standard grip works fine. For that sort of thing. Because it's handheld, I can lift it up, I can get it into a better position so I don't have to turn my hand and my arm at an awkward angle. But when I have bowls and similar percussion on a table in front of me like this, I need to modify my grip. So what I do, and this is very similar to the left hand traditional drummer's grip, which would be where you take a stick like this between in the thumb and in between the two fingers. This is the traditional marching left hand drum grip. So I use a modified version of that and that I sort of hold it, keeping my fulcrum in sort of the same place, but I flip the stick around. So I've got the mallet head going down this time. And then I'll either put it between the first and second finger or the second and third usually the first and second. And then this finger, the first finger can move and control the mallet where the fulcrum is sort of right here. And it's this sort of motion. And I'm actually like kind of a push-pull. Push with the index finger, the first finger, pull back with the second finger. And that's how I would strike the balls. Now, in the case of when the bowls are, are close and, you know, there's no room here for me to strike, I'll strike them inside the rim, have it at a slight angle, and then... And that's all it is, is a strike and then pull it back up. Yeah, I'll move one, let me move one closer here so we can see just... on the outside or on the inside. So that works out really well. Now on, if I've got a bowl on the outside of the table, I can take my other hand with the standard grip and play like that. Or from over on this side, I will do that, but when I'm playing around, usually I have about 12 or 13 bowls on the table in front of me. So they're crowded together, they're close, and I don't, you know, I don't have a lot of room. Here I've got some room, but there's always the danger of that you could hit both. So I tend to play the insides of the bowls. Unless, again, it's an outside bowl where I have free access to hit it that way. Now, one other advantage of this type of grip is I can play inside and get sort of a tremolo. Or I can play between two bowls. And that's easy to do because it's just the fingers moving it back and forth. And again, I don't have to turn my elbow you know, in some sort of a weird way. 
and try to do that. So. Added mallet too. So that's basically how I modify things, and it's the same the same idea. I'm holding it vertically. I don't have to lift it, not like this, and I have to lift the mallet head. It's just hanging there. I can hold it this way indefinitely and then a pendulum motion. I'm swinging it. So it's just, all it is is the opposite of this. I'm going this way here, and I'm going this way here. And for me, because I've played drums for so long, I, I'm, I'm so used to maneuvering the sticks in my hands. It's, it's no big deal for me to go from here to here and back. And it's a very natural motion. I don't have to think about it. It's not like I'm holding my mallet and maybe I'm playing a bell over here and I come over here and I have to think, oh, I have to turn my hand. No, I just I automatically do this because this is how I play the things on the table, pretty much. So, that's all muscle memory, that's all practice. Just been able to move, change the position. So that's basically what I do with the bowls. Now if I'm playing bell plates, Burma bells, other hanging instruments, it's the same motion as the gong. I'm playing them like this, up in the air. We'll get a plate here just for an example. Here's one of my bell plates. So if I'm going to play the bell plate, it's the same thing. It's playing the gong. Same sort of motion. So I essentially, I essentially have these two methods, and they're just variations of each other. Again, just having things up, head up, pendulum motion using the thumb to control the shaft of the stick, control the pressure, and also feel the pressure, using the fingers here to move it, and then flipping it over. You notice my hand stayed in the same place, basically. Flipping it over, and the same sort of pendulum motion the other way. That's it. Pretty simple. But again, something you need to practice. So here's some ideas for you. If you're just playing your bowls with this grip and trying to get your arm and you know, try to get in sideways and twisting your arm to play it, this will allow you total freedom. If you've got a large selection of bowls. Or if you're playing crystal bowls too, you can use this same sort of grip to hold your wand, to move around, use fingers, use wrists, all that. So there we go. That's mechanics of motion. Some ideas for you to try out. If they work for you and you adopt them, that's fine. If they don't work for you, that's fine also. Each of us is very different. So we need to find our own way of holding the mallets and striking our instruments. And these are some ideas you can check out. So thanks for watching. Subscribe down below. Give it a thumbs up if you like it. And please leave some questions. If you have any questions or comments on this or questions on other topics I should cover. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on It's Cup of Time.